Russia, October 1917. From Petrograd, a shock wave pulsed and widened through all this vast land which had once been an empire. The billows beat in every quarter of the world. Let everyone remember that in this war there are no reverses of the Russians, of the English, or of the French alone, and that success or failure is one of the same thing for all. The fervent hopes once expressed by a Russian politician, now, in the winter of 1917, struck an ominous note. In the East, a spectre more alarming than all the shapes of death itself had appeared upon the battlefield. A spectre that had long haunted the war leaders' minds. For here was the most dreaded casualty of all, the will to war itself. Russia could go on no longer. Hindenburg said, Hitherto the unwieldy Russian colossus had hung over the whole European and Asiatic world like a nightmare. Time and time again, her efforts had produced considerable crises for us. Tannenberg, August 1914. The enemy losses were extremely heavy, but our high command believed themselves compelled prematurely to draw away to the east strong forces from the west, where they were trying to secure a rapid decision. Mazurian Lakes, February 1915. Mighty masses rolled up against us, overwhelming masses, each one larger than our whole force. But German resolution bore this load, and Russian blood flowed in streams. Galicia, May 1915. The fearful and continuous tension of the situation in the Carpathians and its reaction on the political situation imperiously demanded some solution. We found ourselves compelled to send large forces there to keep up our pressure upon the enemy. Gorlitze Tarnov, 1915. There was something unsatisfactory about the encounters of this year. The Russian bear had escaped our clutches, bleeding, no doubt, from more than one wound, but still not stricken to death. Would he have enough life force left to make things difficult for us again? Her casualties had been the highest of all the combatant nations. No one knows the figures. Five or eight millions. All we know is that sometimes in our battles with the Russian, we had to remove the mounds of enemy corpses from before our trenches in order to get a fresh field of fire against assaulting waves. Yet in 1916, the Russians had won a great victory over the Austrians in Galicia. The Germans and Austrians had had to stretch their manpower resources to the utmost to resist this blow. In January 1917, an Allied delegation arrived in Russia to develop efficiency for the planned offensive of that year. The British military attaché in Russia wrote, The prospects for the 1917 campaign were brighter than they'd been in 1960. The Russian infantry was tired, but less tired than it had been 12 months earlier. The stocks of arms and technical equipment were larger 
and for the first time supplies from overseas were arriving in appreciable quantities. In fact, desertions from the front ran into hundreds of thousands. Russia had lost at least as many dead as the British and French put together. She had suffered literally beyond endurance. She had reached her limit. Her soldiers, once so brave, had had enough. Now they were getting out of the trenches to fraternize with the Germans, man to man. In the rear, industrialization had been changing the face of Tsarist Russia, drawing peasants into the towns and creating a new, incoherent proletariat. The economy functioned in a welter of administrative confusion. But committees set up to organize production and supply after the appalling breakdowns of the early days of the war had begun to have some effect. By the end of 1916, great improvements had been achieved. Patriotic spirit ran high. Victory over the Germans was the simple aim of most of the population. Pressure for more efficient management of the war was exerted by liberal politicians through the elected parliament, or Duma. But Tsar Nicholas II had no use for constitutional government. At his coronation, he said, I shall maintain the principle of autocracy just as firmly and unflinchingly as it was preserved by my dead father. But Nicholas II was gentler, weaker than his father. Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, wrote, He would never have been chosen by any responsible board of directors to manage any business of any magnitude, and certainly not a business confronted with a serious emergency. He was a devoted family man, deeply fond of his son, the Tsarevich, who suffered from haemophilia, a blood disease which made every scratch dangerous. There was nothing the Tsar liked better than to be with his soldiers and sailors. In 1915, he had made himself supreme commander. He loved the simple link, as he saw it, that bound him to his wider family, the 170 million people of Russia. Emotional loyalty to a paternal Tsar and the mystery of their religion were the simple guiding principles of their lives. The life of the ordinary peasant was miserable. Often they lodged in the same single room hovel with their animals on earthen floors with a hole in the roof for the smoke to escape. Their diet was poor, and the gross mishandling of wartime distribution meant that though food was there, many went hungry. Chaos in the rear had been aggravated too by the hundreds of thousands of refugees who had poured back into Russia in the early defeats. A British member of parliament observed their misery. Serried ranks of emaciated, huddled humanity Brutalized by their abject surroundings, corroded by disease, men, women and children of different races and languages crowded and congested like litters of pigs in an asphyxiating sty. In the towns and factories too there was misery. Strikes had been increasing sharply just before 1914. War, with its shortages and inflation, aggravated the unrest. The 
Tsar himself left affairs more and more to the Tsarina, a German-born but English-educated niece of Queen Victoria. The Tsarina's close friendship with her spiritual advisor, the lecherous and drunken monk Rasputin, led to a widespread campaign against the entire Tsarist regime. In the public mind, this relationship assumed vast dimensions. It became the symbol of all Russia's ills. The murder of Rasputin was hailed as an act of the highest patriotism. The winter of 1916-17 was particularly severe. Fuel was short, food queues lengthened. Pressures on the Tsar to change incompetent ministers continued from all sides. His own cousin wrote to him, The question is, shall Russia be a great state, free and capable of developing strong, or shall she submit to the iron German fist? Certain forces are leading you and consequently Russia to inevitable ruin. It is absolutely indispensable that the ministers and the legislative chambers should work together. The existing situation, with the whole responsibility resting on you and you alone, is unthinkable. The British ambassador, Sir George Buchanan, doing what he could to keep Russia in the war, told the Tsar he must regain the confidence of his people. The Tsar replied, Do you mean that I am to regain the confidence of my people, or that they are to regain my confidence? Suddenly, in the early days of March 1917, frustration in the Petrograd food queues spilled over into revolt. People came out to protest, found many others there, and took courage. For the first time, there was doubt about the troops. The Tsar, true to character, washed his hands of the embarrassing situation and went to the front leaving matters to the palace guard and the Petrograd garrison. Now, turbulent forces suddenly broke the surface of Russian life. The French ambassador watched from the safety of his room. I heard a strange and prolonged din which seemed to come from the Alexander Bridge. Almost immediately, a disorderly mob carrying red flags appeared at the end which is on the right bank of the Neva and a regiment came towards it from the opposite end. It looked as though there would be a violent collision, but on the contrary, the two bodies coalesced. The army was fraternizing with the revolt. The vast Petrograd garrison of some 200,000 men was not typical of the army as a whole. It consisted of raw recruits, war-weary reserves, convalescents, and even punishment battalions. Many deserters from the front had drifted to the capital's streets. Before long, the whole garrison had joined the mob. In a desperate move to get the Tsar to introduce the necessary reforms, the president of the Duma, Rodzianko, sent him a telegram. The Tsar received it at his headquarters. This fat Rodzianko has sent me some nonsense to which I will not even reply. Nothing could stop the sudden upsurge against the monarchy symbol of the country's sufferings. Within days, the Tsar was forced to abdicate, and a 300-year-old dynasty came crashing to the ground. General amnesty was declared and political prisoners were set free among the jubilant crowds. The 
Tsar's unpopular ministers were arrested. It is difficult to say how many lives were lost in the bloodless revolution, but according to most accounts, they were under a thousand. In Petrograd, thanks to the measures taken by the government, the town rapidly resumed its normal aspect and order generally prevailed. This was especially noticeable on the occasion of the burial of the victims of the revolution in the Champ de Mars on April the 5th, when a never-ending procession filed past in the most perfect order from 10 in the morning till late in the evening were in all but some 200 coffins and as each one was lured into the grave a salute was fired from the fortress but no priests officiated at the ceremony which was divested of any religious character somewhat dazed with the success of the revolution Russia had to face the bleak task of deciding where she would go the rising in the streets had been against something now the people had to decide exactly what it had been for. The wish to run the war more efficiently had given the revolution its spark, but hatred of the war had given it much of its momentum. In the confused situation that followed, responsibility fell upon the Duma, responsibility to make good their implied promises. Now they had to do better than the autocracy they had for so long criticized. A provisional government was formed with the liberal Prince Lvov as the first prime minister. A young socialist lawyer, Kerensky, became minister of justice. In the allied capitals where the events in Russia looked simpler than they were, the revolution was hailed as a triumph for the allied cause. The London Times commented, The army and people have joined hands to overthrow the forces of reaction which were stifling the national aspiration and strangling the national efforts. Lloyd George declared in the House of Commons, We believe that the revolution is the greatest service the Russian people have yet made to the cause for which the Allied peoples have been fighting. Germans did their best to hasten it. They launched an offensive in the north towards Petrograd turning the Russian flank above Riga by an amphibious landing on an island in the Gulf of Finland. Hindenburg described the operation as the one completely successful enterprise on either side in which an army and a fleet cooperated. The execution of our plans was rendered so doubtful by bad weather at the outset that we were already thinking of disembarking the troops on board. The arrival of better weather then enabled us to proceed with the venture. From that point, everything went like clockwork. We succeeded in possessing ourselves of Urzel and the neighboring islands. One more pressure was thus added to the sense of crisis in the capital. In Petrograd and at the front, Bolshevik agitators worked tirelessly. Soldiers, do not trust these wolves in sheep's clothing. They call you to fresh slaughter. 
Well, follow them if you like. Let them pave the path for the return of the bloody Tsar with your corpses. Let your orphans, your widows and children, deserted by all, pass again into slavery, hunger, beggary and disease. The Bolshevik following multiplied. Lenin himself returned secretly to supervise the insurrection. On November the 7th, in a superb stroke of political bluff, Trotsky simply proclaimed that the provisional government had fallen and that all power belonged to the Soviet. 20,000 Red Guards appeared on the streets. Bolshevik oratory and subversion worked among the troops. During the next few days, Trotsky's statement became an accomplished fact. The Bolsheviks besieged the Winter Palace, where the provisional government was protected only by a handful of officer cadets and the women's battalion. In a matter of hours, the Bolsheviks captured the palace and arrested the provisional government. The provisional government, like the Tsar before it, had fallen without a struggle. Now Lenin could honor his promise of peace. An armistice was arranged with the Germans, and Russian emissaries went to meet them at Brest-Litovsk. The two sides made a strange contrast. The Germans, stiff, correct, experienced, apparently with all the cards in their hands. The Russians, nervous, uncertain, but with at least one good card. They could play for time. To counter the ever-tightening stranglehold of the Allied blockade, the Germans and Austrians desperately needed access to the vast granaries of the Ukraine. They therefore made a separate peace with the independent anti-Bolshevik government of the Ukraine. A peace treaty with Romania, now near the end of her terror, followed. But there was no peace with Russia. The endless Bolshevik delaying tactics enraged the Germans. They resumed their advance into Russia. The Russian army made no attempt to stop them. Instead, it fell back in a rabble. War is dead in the hearts of men, noted an American observer. The Bolsheviks were forced to accept the harshest terms of peace. The Eastern Front was finished. Hindenburg said, In spite of the conclusion of peace with Russia, it was even now impossible for us to transfer all our effective troops from the east. It was absolutely necessary for us to leave behind strong German forces. Our operations in the Ukraine were not yet at an end. We had to penetrate into their country to restore order there. Only when this had been done had we any prospect of securing food from the Ukraine. Of a very different import, was the military assistance which in the spring we sent to Finland in her war of liberation from Russian domination. The Bolshevik government had not fulfilled the promise it had made us to evacuate this country. We hoped by assisting Finland to get her on our side. of our fighting troops, which still remained in the east, formed the source from which our western armies could be reinforced. 
Now the patient, enduring German army might at last bring off the decisive victory which had escaped its grasp. The troop trains rumbled across Europe, bearing division after division from east to west. Every click of their wheels echoed the ticking away of precious time. For Germany, it was now or never. 